reading this evening is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, that what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. As we look back in Philippians chapter 3 that we began this morning looking at this particular text, verses 7 and 8, Paul references a lot with loss, gain, gain, loss. And it brings up this point of this idea of what is profit and what is loss. Profit or loss is the lesson that I want us to consider this evening. You know, if you think about things that have bring us profit and let's loss, we can probably think of our favorite day of the year, April 15th. We just love, you know, tax day. Uh, some people are earlier. They, they, they want to get it done and over with as soon as possible. Some kind of teeter towards the end, maybe wait. Some love that extension and waiting till October the 15th, but whatever. But when you think about your income tax and filling that out and looking at those statements and filling it out, profit, loss, and understanding the year and collection of the year. Sometimes we want to itemize everything because of the loss that we've incurred that particular year or maybe the profit that we've earned. We understand that from a income tax filing standpoint. We also can understand that when it comes to personal finance, when it comes to our budgeting, when it comes to a month, when it comes to what we bring in, to what comes out, income and out and, and uh, outgo, and thinking about the difference between the two, and hopefully the one is greater than the other. But some months are different than other months. Um, you know, and considering, you know, what we face, so this idea of profit and loss is something that we're very familiar with in our own life. We don't have to be accountants. We don't have to be tax consultants. We don't have to be involved with the crunching numbers day in and day out to understand the importance of something that is profitable for us if it's worth more than what we may lose with that. Again, letting go the idea of, of Philippians, of forgetting those things behind me, is anything and everything that would keep us in our relationship and connecting to Christ Jesus. If anything is going to prevent us from that relationship, then we need to consider that a loss. A loss in our life because it is much greater in the end than at the beginning, if you will. Jesus mentions this idea of profit and loss in the world. You're familiar in Matthew chapter 16. He says, for what does it profit if a man gains the whole world? There is the profit statement. Someone who gains the entire world. Someone that owns everything. Someone that has investments in everything. Everything belongs to this particular person. If you gain it all, that's the profit. Here's the loss to that. Lose your own soul. What is greater? What is greater? Is the loss much greater than the profit? Or is the profit greater than the loss? And we know the answer to that because we're here. 
The loss is much greater than any of the profit of gaining anything that we think we've gained when the grand scheme of things, we really didn't gain it at the end because we let it go when we depart this life. It's reminding of the value of our soul as Jesus puts it there with that profit and loss idea and terminology that how much valuable our soul is compared to what is outwardly and what we see what we experience, what we do day in and day out, that we can get so wrapped up in very easily as if that's much greater than who we are inwardly. I want us to think about, as we look at this lesson, that to me, what Paul is referring to himself and encouraging the church at Philippi, that we really need to ask this question, what is important to me? When I think about gaining something and losing something, and I'm bringing it all into perspective, whether it's physical, whether, and more importantly, when it's spiritual, when I come down to it, what is truly important to me? Now, you have to ask that question for yourself, as I have to ask when it comes to my life. What is truly important to me? Because there lies, whether it's a loss to take, what's important, or whether we gain something that's greater because of how important it is to us. That's basically behind the second idea of what Paul is saying here, it's particularly in 7 and 8 of Philippians chapter 3. And what he's achieved, what he accomplished in Judaism, he threw it, he cast it, he considered it profitless, compared to what he gained in Christ Jesus, even though he would have to lose because of what he gained. And that is a challenge for us as God's people as well. And I love Paul's example. Here's a, here's a go-getter. Here is someone that achieved and excelled up the ladder, but is able to balance the two and see which one was more than the other. Going back to what Jesus says, you can gain it, what if you lose? What does it gain? What does it profit? The first point I want you to look at is this. Dependence on our own achievement is, it equals simply a loss. Paul was an authentic Jew. He's a Christian when he's writing this, but in his previous life, he was authentic Jew. He was authentic because he was ritually pure. What I mean by that is he made the comment, I was circumcised on the eighth day, circumcision going all the way back to the father of the faithful, Abraham. This outward sign of God's promise in relationship, covenant relationship with his people. Paul is saying that I, you know, born into the Jewish faith, born a Jew, was a Jew in the sense of in the authentic sense, is, is the, when it came to the ritual, when it came to the outward sign, when it came to that symbol of males being circumcised on the eighth day according to the promise that was given, according to the custom of Abraham and the promise that God made with him in the law of Moses. Unlike, you think about when Paul encountered proselytes, and proselytes were those people that were Jewish believers, but they weren't born in the Jewish faith. They converted later on in life. Paul had an advantage over those that came into Judaism much later because he was circumcised, as he said, on the eighth day. Notice the second aspect of him being an authentic Jew. He was racially pure. In other words, he was of the stock of Israel. Israel, cherished name, a name that God gave to Jacob because Jacob wrestled with an angel all night. And Israel literally means to struggle with God. And we see Israel living up to that name, playing out when it became a nation and when it was established kings and all the judges' time and all that time period that we can study and read about and see that truly Israel did struggle a lot with God, but he is connected, Paul is, that I am of Israel. More particularly, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. 
And Benjamin was a very special tribe, an interesting tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because through Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin is where Israel chose their very first king, Saul. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. When Israel split, was divided into kingdoms, Benjamin would stay and not leave and stay committed to the house of David. Paul had a great understanding of his, of his upbringing, of his past, of his life in Judaism, and what he achieved in that particular world. He was Hebrew of Hebrews. He was born not just a Hebrew, but he spoke the Hebrew language. So Paul had achieved this great, these great things in the Jewish faith. He had had the best teacher. He had had the best upbringing. He knew his lineage and heritage and where that was. And he was very zealous about it all. But on the way to Damascus, his life changed forever. He was converted, blinded, but taken to Ananias, and Ananias there helping with Saul and his conversion. Why do you wait? Arise and be baptized. Acts 22, verse 16, Paul re- re- reflects on that experience and that, in that moment that he had there after being blinded on the road to Damascus. But Paul says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me? He says, back towards my life before Christ, they were profit me. They gained me. They led me to the next step and next stage of my life. Now I count them as loss. They're loss. That's that's a pretty powerful statement coming from someone who's in prison because of their faith who probably wouldn't have been in prison to begin with if they continued that trajectory, if you will, of the Judaism becoming the Pharisee and and reaching that status and maintaining that. But Paul didn't do that. Paul saw the light, literally speaking, and he, he was transformed. And he was willing to... To, to, to remove that side of his life, he was willing to get rid of that for the sake of Christ. He was willing to lose in order to gain. Paul is a great example for anybody that does struggle holding on to something. Maybe their success is a block to their faith, or what could be potential faith, but they can't let go go like the rich young ruler. They can't let go of who they are, the name that they've established, their reputation, their their portfolio, whatever you want, word you want to use, they can't let that go and give to Christ. Even if they know what and believe that what Jesus is true, He came, He lived, He died. Our achievements in life, as I mentioned this morning, can get, we can get so wrapped up in these things that we almost make them greater than what they really are. Greater than the moment that we experience them, greater than the position that we're in. And what's sad is we're all replaceable, aren't we, from an earthly standpoint. From a business world, we're all replaceable. But we get so wrapped up in these things, we just think this is what we need to do, and it may keep us more living freely in Christ. Paul says, I count it as nothing. I dismiss it. I dismiss the works of mine I've previously done, and it's lost for the sake of Christ's sake. Not just anybody's sake, not just what, what, what I want's sake, it's for Christ's sake. His complete demeanor, his focus, everything about him is completely changed for the better. He no longer depended upon his Jewish heritage for his salvation. 
In fact, all such works and beliefs and practices, he was willing to give up. He was willing to, he was willing to mark it off as a loss because of what he gained in Christ. You see, Paul was more than a religious person. And he was probably, if we have to say, more religious than most religious people in his day and time. And so Paul would have continued going the way that he was going if it wasn't for that Damascus on the way to Damascus experience. What Paul is saying to me, and I think very very plainly in verses 7, that, 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 that my achievements in Judaism, that what have I accomplished, that what I achieved, and that's the point when you're being persuaded by these Jew, Jewish Christians saying you've got to keep on, we've got to keep the law of Moses, we've got to keep some of these practices. No, you don't. You've got to count it for loss for the sake of Christ and what we gain in Him. The second thing that I want to share with you is this, that dependence on anything other than Christ is a loss. Anything. Anything and everything that gets in our way, that, that puts a barrier between us and Christ, is loss. We should see it as loss. It's not a gain. It may feel like a gain in the moment, but it is not a gain eternally. We're reminded again, as I referenced the rich young ruler, we're reminded of the rich man and Lazarus. What appeared to be a gain in life wasn't a gain at all. It was a terrible loss for both. Paul says, yet indeed, I also count all things. He included everything and anything as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus, Christ Jesus, my Lord. What a tremendous statement. Paul didn't count everything as loss before he was converted. It was a continuous thing, daily thing for him. Again, keep in mind where Paul is at when he's writing these words. He's in prison because of his faith. Again, he has no regrets because of the choice he made. He would count everything else for loss because of the knowledge that he had in Christ Jesus. Which is a great question to ask ourselves. What is that worth to you? What is knowing what you know about Jesus worth to you? What's it worth? What's the value of that in, for you in your life? To know what He says in His teaching. To know what He says in His, in, in his commands. To know that w more specifically in His Word what He did for us. To possess that knowledge and have it and attain it. What's that worth? For Paul, anything and everything that would persuade me differently than what I know of Christ is loss. Is loss. What I possess and have and know is tremendous gain. We understand this principle and it's so true, especially spiritually. Knowledge is power. And Jesus reminds us we can know the truth, and the truth can set us free. What you know today about Jesus is valuable. It's valuable. It's valuable not only to you, but to the people around you because of what you know, what leads you, what guides you to do what you do, and how you do the things that you do. But enhancing it more as we continue our day-to-day -day grind of life, pressing forward ahead what lies ahead of us because of what we have and what we possess in Him. Paul, to me, was somebody that didn't settle with the surface level knowledge of Jesus. It wasn't simply just factual and that was it. He raised on the third day, he, he was 40 days, and it was much more. He wanted deeper understanding. He wanted to know more, as much as he can. And what about us? What about our lives? And who we are? And yet, think about what he suffered because of his faith. 
Think about all that he endured in his body, the marks, as he mentioned in Galatians, that his body bore for the sake of Christ. The lashing, the beating, the chains, the shackles, the, 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 the shipwreck, the list goes on and on of the things that he endured, that he suffered but all those things were less to what he knew in Christ. He lost his Jewish position in the Jewish system. He lost his good standing among his fellow countrymen. He went from mo the most beloved Jewish leader on the way to becoming prime to being despised and hated by his own people. But to me, what I think is interesting in this verse is this. He abandoned safe existence. Think about that for a moment. The safer way from a worldly standpoint was to continue the way you're going in Judaism. That was much safer. But Paul didn't live a life based on what was comfortable and what was non-threatening and what was less, um, what, whatever attack is going to be. He, 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 he dedicated his life in service because of the knowledge he possessed and gained in Christ. In the two roads that was presented with Paul, Paul chose the much more difficult road. And it wasn't because it was difficult that he wanted to choose that. It was because of what he knew that resulted in the difficult. And that's the point for us. What we gain, what we possess, what we have in Christ is far greater than anything you may suffer and endure and go through in this life. It's far greater. It's far greater. Paul is not the only one to achieve that and understand that. And even suffer to lose things, but still gain in the process. You remember the thorn in the flesh that he prayed three times to God for it to be removed? But he realized this point that in my weakness I am made strong. That in my suffering, in my uncomfortable situation, I am stronger in Christ. There are Paul-like people on a day-to-day -day basis who in their faith leads them in hardship and leads them through suffering that's unwarranted. But because of their faith and because of, of truth and because of wanting to live a life that's according to God's plan, not the world's plan, it, it conflicts with so many things. Paul is reminding us that when you look at loss and profit and gain and lose and, and, and and obtain, and, and all these things, again, what's important to you? For Paul, it was Christ, in Christ alone. For Paul, it was in Jesus, in Him being crucified. That is the one thing I proclaim. And everything else that was in the way that would hinder that is, is loss. The last point for your consideration is this. Dependence upon Christ equals a profit. When we find Christ, when we have a relationship, when we are born again, we have everything that we need. We have laid up not treasures on earth, we, have, we are laying up treasures that are in heaven. When Paul said again that he found Christ, in other words, Christ is not drive-through for me. Christ is a permanent address for my life. I found Him and I am staying with Him. I'm not passing through. I'm not 
finding him, then giving him up and losing him. He knew. He knew in Jesus the value and the great cost and what he had had and what he experienced in the knowledge that he possessed was great. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven being like a, you know, like like a great treasure that is found. The man he he sells all that he has to obtain the field in which the treasure is found. He willingly sells everything. He loses everything for the sake of what he found and what he has gained. Jesus talked about that when it came to following him in discipleship. Do we consider what the cost is? Are we willing to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him in life? Paul wanted to completely absorb the nature, the work, the fellowship, and the presence of who Jesus was and is. Did Paul accomplish this on his own merit? No, the the answer is no. And we can't either. That's why God meets us, and we need God's help in that. And God is the one that forgives us, and there is the connection, and there is the relationship with that. But there are things to do on our part, that's for sure. Circumcision, the works of the Old Testament, the law of Moses, did not bring justification for Paul. What did was Christ, and his relationship in Christ, and being forgiven in Christ. And being born again. Paul wanted to know more about Christ. He wanted to have this deeper understanding of Jesus. To be close to Him. Yet Paul had no regrets in the choice that he made. Paul didn't look back to making that decision that he made there in Damascus. He didn't second-guess that decision. It was the best decision that Paul made. And I would say for us, it's the best decision that we can make. Jesus, in illustration, says to count the cost. Count it. He talks about someone building a tower. How would they build a tower when they first haven't first considered Counting the cost. We understand that in all aspects of life. Going on a trip, make sure you have enough money to provide you on the way of your trip. Monthly bills, making sure you have enough to sustain you through the month, etc., etc. You understand that. You've got to count the cost. How much more so in our spiritual life counting the cost The sacrifice on our part, living sacrifice, Paul says, that is holy and acceptable to God. Every day, every challenge, every event, every moment, knowing who we are, who we belong to, what's important to us, and where we're going. Because what we have to give up, what we lose, is far less than what we have gained in Christ Jesus. Bart is select the appropriate song we're going to stand and sing. And whether you're here in person or online, the invitation of our Lord is for us all. To examine ourselves in the faith, to see where we stand before our Heavenly Father. To understand what we might need to lose to gain more of in Jesus. Put on Christ in that watery grave come up a newness of life. As he told uh, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. Nicodemus thought to re-enter his mother. No, you got to be spiritually born again of the water and of the Spirit. Contacting that, being cleansed because of the power of the blood, as we will stand and sing that, the power of Jesus' blood that continues to cleanse us from unrighteousness. If Christ is what's important to us, 
then it will show. It will show. It will be evident. And it will be seen. And that's why Jesus says, you're light and you're salt. And you're a city that sets on a hill. That's what we need to continue to do as we press forward as a local congregation of the body of Christ. If we can help you in person or online, please come as together we all stand and sing.